While Islam Makachev was unhappy with the lack of hype for his super fight with Alexander Volkanovsky, oftentimes the UFC will oversell a fight, particularly if they think a contender will get them a whole bunch of those pay-per-view buys they love so much, or if they feel like they need to sell you on the contender in question for the championship because maybe you're just not buying it. Now, hype doesn't only come from the promotion, we fans do it as well, and it oftentimes leads to situations like the 10 instances on our list today, where in one way or another, challengers for the strap were overhyped and as a result, either underwhelmed with their performance performance, or time has shown that maybe they were thrust into the title picture prematurely or even inexplicably. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, and these are the 10 most overhyped title contenders of all time. Number 10. Ali Baga Utinov vs. Demetrius Johnson As we'll see many times on this list, when you have a well-established champion, for instance flyweight go Demetrius Johnson, a man who at the time of UFC 174 was on his fourth title defense and was pretty much looked at as near perfect, the UFC is going to prop up new and interesting talent so they can feed their champ. By this point, DJ had already fought Joseph Benavidez twice, beat John Dotson, beat John Moraga, beat Ian McCall, all the top guys at 125. Enter Ali Baga Utinov. He came into the UFC with a 10-2 record. He was a Russian combat Sambo silver medalist. You know how we fans love us some scary stoic Sambo guys. He looked the part, his skill set seemed like he might be a challenge. He scored a KO victory in his debut. Two fights later, as the number seven flyweight in the world, that's how fast you get into the top 10 in a division cleaned out. Ali took on John Lineker, who was sitting at number 5. Baga Utinov scored wins in two of three rounds, and that was enough to prop him up for the next title challenge against DJ. The champ would win 50-45 across the board, and Baga Utinov would lose two of his next three and leave the UFC in 2016. Number 9. Nate Quarry vs. Rich Franklin Right out of the gate on tough one, when Nate Quarry was chosen first for Captain America's team, the hype for his eventual middleweight title challenge would grow. To be honest, it was more to do with the show's popularity most likely than anything specific about Nate. He did end his season of the show on episode 8 when he was eliminated because of an ankle injury he suffered in episode 5, but he still fought on the finale and got a TKO in under 4 minutes. He then followed that up with two first round finishes of Shoney Carter and Pete Sell, that one was in just 42 seconds, and most importantly, it was on Spike TV. And so, with Tough as big as ever following the Griffin Bonner fight and that finish of Sell, it seemed like a no-brainer for the UFC to grant a title shot to a Tough contestant for the first time ever. Just months after the finale, mind you, Corey would get KO'd by Rich Franklin in under three minutes at UFC 56 and never see the title picture again, but there's no doubt the tough hype helped carry him to that opportunity. Number 8. Frank Trigg vs. Matt Hughes Nice dick shots, Frank. Alright, so Trigg of course became somewhat of a rival to Matt Hughes, being on the wrong end of his incredible comeback in their second fight, and of course we all know him today as the beloved mustachioed referee that he is, but it's hard to say that he wasn't just a bit overhyped coming into his first encounter with Hughes for the welterweight title at UFC 45. After all, this was his debut in the promotion. And now, I know that wasn't as uncommon back then, and yes, he did have a record of 10-1, and 1, but the big fight that won him that opportunity, a bout, mind you, that happened a whole year before he would make his debut, was for the WFA title against Dennis Hallman, a fight he won because of a cup shot. Play right here, Trig. Trig, oh, right yeah. here. Yeah. Smashed him. I just kicked him, he smashed him. And then a whole year after that, without any other time in the cage, he was brought in to fight Hughes. And Matt had kind of beaten everybody that there was to beat. This was right before he would lose the strap to BJ Penn, who wasn't even a welterweight. So we're talking peak Hughes here. Trigg would be defeated in the first round via rear naked choke. Number seven, Dan Hardy versus George St. Pierre. There were so many things that Dan Hardy had going for him that would lead to his eventual welterweight title challenge at UFC 111 against George St. Pierre. First and foremost, he was good and from England. Being a standout fighter from the UK is great UFC business as we have seen time and time again. Because that market can really boom when they've got stars. Hardy also had a unique and marketable look with his cool mohawk and such, especially in contrast to the very clean-cut GSP, who, just like the other two champions on this list so far, had well established himself as an all-time great, soon to be considered the best welterweight of all time, which also helped the situation. GSP needed contenders, fresh faces. He'd beat BJ Penn, he'd beat Matt Hughes, Josh Koscheck, Matt Sarah, John Fitch, Tiago Alves, and so a new contender from the UK who was on a four-fight run in the promotion that had a good looking was great on the microphone. Why don't you like jo Josh Koscheck? Let's have a show of hands who likes Josh Koscheck. Who's a fan of Josh Koscheck? What, seven, eight? Seven. <laughs> 
I mean, how could they not hype this guy up? And man, did they. The lead up to UFC 111, I bought this one hook, line, and sinker. This mohawk guy with the attitude was a serious threat to the champion, and GSP better be on his shit. Turns out he was, very much so, but Hardy's gutsy performance in the face of a five-round loss grew him a legitimate following and respect beyond the hype. Number 6. Vulcan Ozdemir vs. Daniel Cormier Yet again, when a division is hurting for new and interesting title challengers, it doesn't take much to get yourself hyped up and in a position to win a championship. Vulcan Ozdemir is another great example. He had two things going for him. He had a cool nickname, No Time, as in he didn't have time for this shit, and wow did he demonstrate that. Not in his UFC debut, mind you, that fight went to a decision. One, he would emerge from victoriously via split against OSP. No, it was his next two fights, Misha Serkinov and Jimmy Manawa, both dispatched in under 50 seconds via KO. The man said he had no time, and he meant it. The other factor was, of course, that DC needed somebody to fight. JBJ got himself stripped and suspended. By that point, DC had already beat Rumble twice, beat Gus. Who else was there? How about some big-time hype? Vulcan would get TKO'd in the second round, and is at current 3-5 and five in his last eight fights since. Number 5. Darren Till versus Tyron Woodley The same hype curse that befell fellow countryman Dan Hardy would come for Liverpool's very own Darren Till when he was thrust into the welterweight title picture far earlier than he should have been. Now, don't get me wrong, Till was certainly somebody that people saw in the near-future title picture. He was undefeated with 17 wins, he'd just beaten Donald Cerrone and Stephen Thompson in back-to-back -back bouts, but that was Cowboy's third loss in a row at the time, and Thompson was coming off those two title challenges against Woodley, he just wasn't fighting in a way that fans really wanted to see much at the time. And Till's win over him wasn't exactly exciting either. He also missed weight for that fight, his second time doing so in the UFC. But Thompson was still number one for some reason in the rankings, and the hype in Liverpool for that main event showed that Till was a star. With obvious contender and interim champion Colby Covington on the sideline, the UFC decided to throw Darren into the title picture largely due to his popularity. Woodley would decimate the challenger, and Till has been trying to recover and regain a top spot in the promotion ever since. Number 4. Jorge Masvidal vs. Kamaru Usman I think you could call Masvidal's rise the very definition of hype. Not to say that in a negative way, or to say that he wasn't worthy. I mean, when you flying knee KO a guy who's never lost in just five seconds and beat down Nate Diaz in front of the president and The Rock for a belt they made up just for you, how the hell was this guy not going to get a title fight? Even a second one immediately afterwards, despite the fact that the first was wholly uncompetitive. Which is to the point of this entry, we have rarely seen somebody's career skyrocket as quickly and as steeply as Jorge Masvidal's. Give him the three-piece with the soda. And very much to his credit, he didn't do this coming in as a fresh-faced up-and-comer like Connor did or BJ Penn. Hey, how's your brother ballpoint? Mm. Oh, that's funny. And then, because your last name's Penn. This guy was 45 fights into his career, had already been considered as what he was to just about anyone who actually knew who he was, and so to be able to reinvent himself and make the impact that he did, it is something that will never be replicated. But I think that's just a testament to how insanely massive his hype was, coming off that incredible 2019. Number 3. Chael Sonnen vs. John Jones Okay, this fight was 100% uncut hype. It all started with UFC 151, the event that was cancelled because of Dan and Henderson's injury, but ultimately blamed on John Jones. A situation that Chael Sonnen capitalized on more than anybody else, going on ESPN after the news of the event's cancellation to lay into Johnny. You know, I, I just don't know why he won't fight me next Saturday. I, I, what else does he have to do? Is there like a wine tasting at the local racetrack or something I haven't heard about? Maybe Dana didn't make it clear enough that he was willing to fly Jones out. Maybe John thought he had to drive. And plant the seeds for what would eventually become an entire season of The Ultimate Fighter, which would culminate in a light heavyweight title title challenge at UFC 159. The season was admittedly a slam dunk, but we can't pretend that this fight made any sense at all besides financially. Sonnen's previous bout was a middleweight rematch against Anderson Silva for the title, a bout he lost. He also hadn't competed at light heavyweight in eight years. The fight was entirely unwarranted, and everybody knew it going in. Despite that, people were excited to see the rivalry play out, a testament to Chael's ability to sell a card. The fight went just about as you would expect, but the card broke 500,000 buys, so who really lost here? you know? Number 2. Tank Abbott versus Maurice Smith. Big badass beer drinking brawler motherfucker. That's pretty much everything you need to know about Tank Abbott. His name is Tank. Nobody even calls him David because he doesn't even look like a David. David. UFC Hall of Famer Maurice Smith had just come off his shocking upset victory for the heavyweight title against Mark Coleman, a man that looked to be invincible, especially against someone who was not a grappler like Smith, who came from the kickboxing world. Maurice's training across disciplines, however, helped him win
in the day and made him an MMA pioneer. As a follow-up, he would fight fan favorite and perpetual tournament runner-up Tank Abbott. What makes this fight especially hilarious is that Tank was coming off two losses in a row. First to Don Fry via rear naked choke in the Ultimate Ultimate 96 tournament final, and then to Vitor Belfort at UFC 13 via TKO in just 52 seconds. Now, this wasn't a planned bout, Abbott replaced Dan Severn, but the fact he was given the opportunity at all was built entirely on his rep. He succumbed to leg kicks eight minutes into the fight. Number one, Betch Kohea versus Ronda Rousey. Yes, she's the ultimate hype job for as slick as it was for Chael to insert himself into the light heavyweight title picture. At least he was a star at that point. He was a well-known commodity and he leveraged that. Betch Kohea went from a split decision win against Julie Kedzie, a fight she absolutely lost in her UFC debut, to three fights later, a title challenge versus the biggest star in the sport, Ronda Rousey, in Brazil no less, her home country. How did she do it? It was simple yet genius. She beat up Ronda's friends. At the time, Ronda's clique was well known, the four horsewomen as they were calling themselves, and two of those fighters, Jessamine Duke and Shayna Baszler, were in the UFC. And so, after Betch defeated Duke, she made a little gesture that one was down, and then after defeating Baszler, she did the same. Strike three. I mean, easily built in storyline. Ronda was already running through everybody else. Betch is talking shit, let's put this thing together. To her credit, Kohea sold the villain role incredibly well in the lead up, but only lasted 34 seconds before getting KO'd. She would go on to lose five of her next eight before retiring in 2021. You know who I hope never retires? The editor of this video, Luke Taylor. Please follow him on his socials, as well as Ben Rosette, who is always coming at you with the soundtrack. You could also like and subscribe, that would make everybody here happy. What other contenders were overhyped coming into their title challenge. Let me know in the comments, and thanks for watching. Enjoy yourself today, maybe go get some pizza. I'll see you later, guys.